Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India friends welcome to the class of public international law lecture number 5 today we will be discussing subjects of international law i am dr ashutosh acharya senior assistant professor law center 2 faculty of law university of delhi well friends again it's a topic of great importance since just like in domestic legal system we see that individuals are the subjects of international law or domestic organizations for that matter companies for that matter are subjects of domestic legal system when they are subjects that means that they are regulated by the law of the land and they are to act and function as per the law of the land so it is for them law is available law facilitates the transaction between them amongst themselves so today we will identify the subjects as far as traditional understanding of the subjects under international law is concerned and how things changed in the last 50 to 60 years or in the last century you can say or in contemporary times how do we see subjects of international law what are the complexities in a given situation where things are simple that a state primarily being the subject of international law but then we also see complex situations where there are occupied territories where territories or states are not recognized what happens in such situation are they subjects of international law whether there is a criteria to identify subject of international law if there is what is it all of these questions will be answered today in this particular lecture so the learning objectives for the day would be to understand the concept of legal personality in international legal system now friends when i say or when we say subjects of international law that means if something is recognized or identified under the regime or under the domain of law then it means that particular body is carrying legal personality unless and until a body is a legal personality which means that it has been identified under the regime of law that means it will then have certain rights and obligations if a particular body is not a legal personality that would entail from a facile that that particular body is devoid of certain rights and obligations or is devoid of any type of rights or obligations so what does law say and how does it compromise with the factual situation whether it increases its domain to include as many bodies as possible to be identified or characterized as legal personality or whether it takes a restrictive approach and considers only certain bodies to be legal personality ultimately becoming the subject of international law what is a legal personality we will discuss that but in general if we try to understand it is a body that can sue and be sued that means a body that has a remedy in a particular given set of legal system and a body against whom another second party or third party will have the remedy so legal personality gives you a right to remedy at the same time gives the right to another person against you to claim a remedy so unless and until you are recognized as a legal personality in a given set of legal system you cannot be categorized to be subject of that particular legal system 
the utility of law depends on that particular aspect. If there is no remedies, if there are no rights and obligations existing on the part of a particular body, if the law specifically expressly does not recognize that particular body, then how can we say that that particular body is the subject of a particular legal system. So, to be a part of legal system, the body must have certain constituent elements to be fulfilled to become a legal system, to become a part of a legal system. Therefore, we will try to understand the concept of legal personality in international law. I am sure that in certain other subjects, you will understand the concept of legal personality as far as domestic legal system is concerned. In jurisprudence, perhaps, we will go through this particular aspect that what all individuals, what all bodies, organizations, etc. can be categorized as legal personality. But the same subject or the same criteria is not followed prima facie as far as international legal system is concerned. Where individuals are the prime subjects of domestic legal system, perhaps individuals are not the prime subjects of international legal system. The second objective for the day would be to deconstruct and construct the idea of a state and know about the criteria of formation of a state. It has been in a doubtful situation in the past and even today that how do you conclude that a particular given territory is a state because we have been saying this again and again that the states are the primary subjects of international law and it is the states that enter into treaties, their practices ultimately cumulatively result into international custom. They are the ones who by their consent create international law. They are the primary objects wherein they function and form international organizations. So, the main players of the international legal system are a state and therefore, without a doubt, we can say that a states are the primary subjects of international law. However, it becomes pertinent to understand the concept of the word state, how a state is formed, whether there is legal criteria, how do we understand the idea of a state as far as legal personality is concerned. Therefore, we will try to construct and deconstruct the idea of a state and know about the criteria of formation of a state. Thirdly, to learn about sui generis territories. There are territories in today's time which are not per se completely fulfilling the aspect or requirements of a state, but even then they are territories. Do they qualify to become a legal personality? in the international legal system and that is why we have the sui generis territories, territories differing from the traditional basic fundamental idea of a state, but still can they be categorized as international legal personality. We will look at that particular aspect as, as well and we will see certain examples as well. The last objective that would be with us today is to understand the politics and law of coming into being of a state. How politics play its role as far as becoming or not becoming a subject of international law is concerned. How politics plays its role as far as making of law pertaining to subject of international law is concerned. So, we will again discuss the interplay between politics and law as far as the subjects of international law are concerned. Let us first try to understand the concept of legal personality under international law because once you claim and categorize that a particular body is a legal personality under international legal system, then we are in a comfortable position to categorize that particular legal personality to be a subject of international law. So, generally if we try to understand individuals and companies possessing rights and duties, enforceable law. They can sue and be sued in domestic legal system. So, under domestic legal system, it is the companies or individuals or organization or any other body 
recognized in the domestic legal system to become a legal personality it has certain rights it has certain duties it can go to court can appear before court as a legal personality right? however it is the function of law to apportion such rights and duties to such entities as it sees fit as without legal personality institutions and groups cannot operate for they need to be able to maintain and enforce claims law therefore determines the nature and scope of personality if you look at companies act it identifies how a company can be formed it entails the rights and duties of the constituent bodies and elements of company and the company in a holistic manner so not as a natural person but as an artificial person we see company as we can see company as a legal personality the same argument goes for any other artificial body that is created by law or that is recognized by law in the domestic legal system to be a legal personality and ultimately be a subject of that particular domestic legal system personality involves certain concepts within law under examination such as status capacity competence as well as the nature and extent of particular rights and duties so what does personality do it actually involves certain concepts within the law that has to be examined or that can be examined and what can you examine you can examine the status one can examine the capacity and can examine the competence so what do we mean by status competence and capacity status generally means or determines power and obligation which in other words can be said to be that a status determines what are the rights and obligations of a particular legal personality or a particular body once power or rights and obligations are identified automatically there is justiciability attached to that particular aspect that once if any obligation is breached by you or 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 against you in both the scenarios either the body can claim or claim can be brought against that particular body so on these basic pedestals we see when there is existence of right and obligation the status of that particular body gets identified then there is capacity it links status that is the rights and obligations with particular rights and duties so once in general the status is identified which determines the power and obligations in general what are the specific rights and duties in existence whether you have the capacity to claim or you don't have the capacity to claim whether a particular body is immune from claiming or whether a particular body another body is immune where you cannot enforce your right so immunity is also to be identified so in general rights and duties would exist but in exceptional scenarios a body may be immune or another body may be immune where this particular body cannot claim against the another body so it can be any kind of situation but the conclusion here is as far as the status and competence competence and capacity is concerned that one can bring a claim and a claim can be brought against that particular body the constituent elements surrounding this particular conclusion are based on rights and duties endowed upon that particular body whole process operates within the confines of legal system or relevant legal system which circumscribes its personality nature and definition when we say circumscribes its personality nature and definition we mean to say it circumscribes the rights and duties you don't have absolute rights or you don't have absolute duties even if you have it will be identified defined but generally it is circumscribed under the relevant legal system also the nature and definition what do we mean by a certain words in most of the acts we see that if there is a right and duty mentioned with respect to certain subject matters so for example in sale of goods if there are rights and duties of seller and buyer the word goods would be defined the word seller would be defined the word buyer would be defined if it is companies act the word company would be circumscribed that what do we mean by the word company what do we mean by the word buyer seller goods etc so in any particular legal system the body if it is a legal personality if it has certain rights and duties under a certain law 
it gets circumscribed. The personality gets circumscribed, the nature and definite definition gets circumscribed. So, there is a definite understanding of particular right and duty under the relevant legal system. Now, let us understand personality under international law. So, as we see that states again as I say are the most important legal persons. Lord Rupach has said or has believed in the orthodox, orthodox positivist doctrine and has been explicit in the affirmation that only states are subjects of international law. However, unlike Lord Rupach, there are other jurists who believe that the progression in the international legal system has led to identification of international organizations also to be subjects of international law. Friends, if you remember in the last class, we discussed the definition of international law laid out by Oppenheim in its ninth edition in 1991, wherein it recognizes international organizations as well to be the subjects of international law and goes ahead to say that wherever recognition comes into being, to some extent directly or indirectly individuals also become subjects of international law. So, therefore, we see a difference of opinion and difference of approach as far as juristic belief is concerned with respect to subjects of international law. Whereas, one thing is clear that orthodox positivists believed that states are the only subjects of international law because without a state participation, no organization can be formed or represented. Individuals cannot directly approach against their own state or any other state before any international fora since there is no fora which allows them to reach directly. The states would not allow them to do so because allowing them to do so would again or may hamper the aspects of territorial integrity, sovereignty and when we say that territorial integrity and sovereignty are the basic tenets of formation of international legal system of today's time, of contemporary times, giving individuals such expansive rights would be detrimental to the idea of a state. And therefore, to protect the idea of a state in an under according to an orthodox positivist jurist, the state becomes the primary subject of international law, the primary legal personality under international law and does not allow individuals to reach directly against the state before any international fora. Now, when we say all of these things and understand and conclude that states are the primary subjects of international law, then we must understand what do we mean by state? What is the actual understanding of the word state? Whether there are any criteria or requirements that must be fulfilled as far as the word state is concerned. Well, friends, in 1933, this trial was made that is to define a state. And Article 1 of the Montevideo Convention on Rights and Duties of States, 1933, tries to identify and define what do we understand by the state, word state. What is the definition of the word state? What is a state? So, it laid down four criteria that if those four criteria are fulfilled, we can say that a particular given territory or piece of land is a state. What are those four criteria? The first one is that there must be a permanent population. There, second, there must be a defined territory. Third, there must be a government. Fourth, there must be capacity to enter into relationship with other states. Well, friends, what do we mean by permanent population? That means a population that is a static in nature has been living in a particular piece of land and continues to stay and reside in that particular piece of land and is willing to continue to live. So, these past, present, future criteria can help us determine that the population is not moving from one part of the land to another part of the land which means that crossing a particular civilization and moving into another civilization continuously. So, the population must be at one particular place. Okay. The second criteria is 
a defined territory. And when we say defined territory, it means to say that the boundaries of the state or the boundaries of the territory must be demarcated, must be identified and they must be properly defined. And when we say defined, it means actual demarcation of the territorial boundary. If there is problem with the actual demarcation of the territorial boundary, then it will not qualify to be a state. Well, friends, such problems, such criteria sometimes create little problems. The criteria being permanent population and at the same time defined territory. There can be problems in scenarios where there are warlike situations, where there is armed conflict. Population tend to move from one piece of land or from one mass of the land to another piece of the land. Populations may move from one state to another state and that is how refugees are created. States secede, the states also go for session, the states go for mergers, states go for demerger. So, when such instances happen, what will be the fate of a state? Boundaries change, defined territory cannot be maintained or no state can guarantee the maintenance of defined territory for the times to come or for inevitability. There is no guarantee that the boundaries that we see today would continue to exist even tomorrow. But the idea primarily that has been accepted as a matter of international policy is to maintain international boundaries and not change those international boundaries, especially by use of force and warfare. So, even if there is an armed conflict, it must be for a particular purpose, not to expand your territory. That is the basic international law idea, also recognized under United Nations Charter as one of the basic principles, wherein we say that states must respect sovereignty of each other and territorial integrity of each other. It's of each other. So, when you guarantee such aspects, certainly there should be defined territory then, there must be a population which is permanent and largely there is, but then there will, there, there are certain problems in such a scenario where a state tends to change or a state is forced to change. In such situations, the definition can then be affected because then the population is changing, the idea of permanency can be affected, the idea of defined territory can be affected and that is why most of the states did not accept this criteria. The third criteria friends is that there must be a government. If there is what, if there is a government certainly yes we can say that it is a state because a state requires representation and it is the government that represents the state. What if for a certain period of time, if there is a revolution in a particular state, there is no government, can we say that for that particular period of time, the state is not a state because there was no government for that particular period of time. So, when turmoil situations come into being in certain territories or in certain states, will it give away all of its rights and duties and legal personality of being a state? Will it not be a subject of international law? These are, this is another question that we have before us when we say that there must be a government. What happens in situations where there is no government for a longer period of time? Will it not be a state? It is again a question which remains a question largely whether it will be qualifying as a state or not. The fourth question is capacity to enter into relationship with other states. Whether a state has a capacity to enter into legal relationship or not will be defined by the internal laws of a particular state and also it is based on the recognition by other states. So, dependency can lead to non-fulfillment of this particular criteria that is the capacity to enter into relationship with other states. So, due to certain hurdles, states largely refused 
to accept these criteria as binding criteria of being a state. And that is why we do not see Montevideo Convention on Rights and Duties of States to be a binding law as far as definition of a state is concerned. So, we can here after this conclude there is, there is no definition of a state, but yes more or less largely we can say that generally if a particular territory is having a permanent population and generally or most most of its boundaries define not maybe not all of its but let us say most of its boundaries define and there is a government and there is the government has the capacity to enter into relationship with other states then certainly we can say that it is a state in general understanding arbitration commission of the european conference on yugoslavia 1991 in opinion number 1 declared that the state is commonly defined as a community which consists of a territory and a population subject to an organized political authority characterized by sovereignty government's control over the population and territory so we can in general conclude that if we need to understand the legal idea behind the existence of the word state or understanding the word state under law we can take help of the definition or explanation given by arbitration commission of the european conference on yugoslavia in 1991 where it identifies the similar criteria as mentioned in montevideo convention and tries to identify certain relevant factors which leads to formation of a state and there is there must be territory and a population and that population must be subject to an organized political authority characterized by sovereignty and by sovereignty we mean to say that if a particular political authority is having an effective control over the population or control over the population in a given territory can exercise the aspects of jurisdiction then there must not be anyone above that particular political authority till the time that goes well it can be characterized as state and that also includes as far as the understanding of sovereignty is concerned government's control over the population and territory so control over population and territory becomes an essential aspect not merely having a permanent population defined territory and a government and capacity to enter into international relationship but control my friends today in today's time especially becomes one of the essential criteria of identifying a particular territory to be a state if temporarily if a state loses its control over a given territory or population that will not devoid that particular territory to be a state in long term or in longer period of time the cases the instances are witnessed or understood that what will happen in the longer period of time yes certainly it also happens that if a certain territory and population is taken over by let's say some other state then after few years that particular taken over territory or occupied territory by the second state becomes the part of the second state and the first state loses that particular portion but it will lose its hold or control over a particular given territory just like as we see in the matter of crimea where crimea was the part of ukraine and then now we see that it becomes part of russia and many states have recognized crimea now to be a part of russia so the only status that has changed is that of crimea a state ukraine has lost a certain territory and a certain population but it has not lost its its capacity to be a state or the status of being a, a state so in certain situations also unless and until the complete or majority of the territory and or the population is lost the claim to be a state cannot be removed in situation where we see the case of let's say yugoslavia majority of its territory and population 
was seceding in 1991. At the end, in 1992, we see that Yugoslavia had lost most of its constituent territories, resulting into seven to eight different territories, Kosovo, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Croatia, Slovenia, Macedonia, and others. So, when these different states came out of Yugoslavia, then we cannot say that Yugoslavia is now anymore in existence as a legal personality because most of its territory and population is, is not in existence. So, again here we see that it will depend on the circumstances that whether, whether a state is still continues to, the, to be the same legal personality or is no more the same legal personality and this gets identifies, identified on the basis of population, territory and the government that is controlling that population in the given territory. So, these are certain, certain identifying criteria. However, at the same time, we see that politics play a significant role as far as recognition of a state is concerned. As we see that Taiwan was initially a member of the United Nations, whereas we see that after the request of the China, Taiwan was no more a member of United Nations organization. Now, what does this show? This shows that Taiwan still is existing as a territory having a definite population, also having a government, but at the same time, we see that it is not a member of United Nations organization. So, let me also point this particular aspect here, that it is not necessary to be a member of United Nations organization to be recognized as a legal personality or to be a state or to be recognized as a subject of international law. A state even if is not a member of United Nations organization or any other organization for that matter, international organization, it is not an essential criteria to be recognized as a legal personality under international law. Well, friends, here again, as I said, politics play a pertinent significant role as far as the state being a subject of international law is concerned. We will expansively understand this particular aspect in the upcoming slides. Now, when we talk about a state and the complexities that may arise around the world, we see that there has to be certain criteria in order to understand that whether a particular state is a still a legal personality under international law or not. The first criteria that we see is about territorially effective, that is territorial effectiveness. Unless and until there is territorial effectiveness, which means unless and until there is a control of the government or political authority in the given set of territory, we cannot say that it is a state. So, now again let me clarify that if sometimes the control over the population is lost, it will not devoid the state of its legal personality. Where there is a hope where there is a future that the political authority is in a position to take control of the given territory over the population, then also we can say that a state is a legal personality. Minor or temporary changes of political authority revolutions do not affect largely the existence of legal personality of a state in international law. It is only that if for long term and there is no hope and expectation that the previous state or population would come into place, only in such scenario where it, is, it can be seen that now the state is no more into existence, it is now under the control of some other state that it has ceded to some other state or it has seceded from a particular state and it, it, it is not going to come into being or the older position is not going to be retained then in such scenario we can assume and say that the state has lost, lost its legal personality. So, let me give you an example, another example. Let us say that Federal Republic of Germany that we see today was divided into two parts after the Second World War. One of the part was controlled by elite, elite forces that is the West Germany or, and as well as the East Germany, the other part being controlled by USSR. So, what do we see? when they merged, the older identity was removed, a new identity came into being 
with a cumulative right and duty that was in existence prior to coming into force and that they will take in future as well. So, they, there they had an agreement at that point of time for certain um, obligations and rights which may be, which were largely economic in nature. So, there has to be territorial effectiveness as far as existence of a state is concerned. Now, there is no minimum criteria for population or territory, but effective control over a territory is necessary. Now, it should be regarded more as an indication of some sort of coherent political structure and society than sophisticated legislative executive organ. There may be problems with respect to legislative organ, legislative body, executive body, but it must have political structure and it must have control over the given population and territory. Recent practice with regard to the new states of Croatia and Bosnia and Herzegovina emerging out of former Yugoslavia suggests modification from effective control to recognition that is even for territories not in control of the state. So, in recent times, especially after 1980s and 1990s, we have seen a shift of criteria to recognize a particular state. Earlier, we were going for traditional understanding of the idea of a state that it must have territory, population and uh, government and then it, the, the, there must be competence and control. But the shift shows that politics has played now or political aspects has played its role significantly in changing the paradigms of making a particular state to be a legal personality under international law. Now, this shift is seen from traditional criteria to new political criteria. The earlier criteria was more law based, the new criteria which is based on recognition of a state is based on politics. Recognition is nothing but where a state, a particular state recognizes another state to be a state. So, if let us say Yugoslavia broke into different territories and if United States recognized Kosovo, Croatia and certain other states to be an independent new state, such mere, merely recognizing such independent entities would entail them or recognize them to be a state. Even if there is no control, even if there is no territorial effectiveness, it would still be a state, especially for US. And we also see that once a certain powerful state recognizes, other states also come into being in order to recognize those states. If it fulfills their international relation based politics. So, politics again as I said plays an important role as far as recognition of a state is concerned. So, recognition which is more political and less legal in nature becomes the new criteria as far as formation of a state and international legal personality is concerned. At the same time losing effective control does not have effect upon the status of that state as a state or will not obviate a statehood. Collapse of governance within a state also known as failed state has no necessary effect upon the status of that state as a state and capacity to enter into legal relationship with other states is an essential criteria because as we said recognition becomes an important criteria. So, once a, a particular state recognizes another state it will enter into or it may enter into legal relationship with other state. So, the capacity comes into being the moment you enter into international relationship with other state. So, recognition again I would say becomes the modern factor to identify that whether a particular state is a legal personality or not. The new criteria in addition to recognition or as a basis of recognition is right to self-determination. So, we will see how self-determination in criteria of statehood functions. Now, apart from a state or having a state, we also see that it, once a state is recognized as a legal personality or as a state that yes, this new territory is now a state and we recognize it. In such situations, we see that there is no political authority or single political authority taking care of that particular territory. In such situations, we also see that sometimes there are international administrations. So, having a legislative body, administrative body or judicial body is not a cut edge criteria in order to identify that a particular territory is a state. In situations, for example, we have seen that when again I would take the example of Yugoslavia, Yugoslavia turned into eight different states. We see that in Kosovo especially, we see that there was turmoil, there was 
conflict between different communities residing or existing in the Kosovo. So, we see that United Nations in order to allow maintenance of peace and security in that particular region sent a mission which is known, which is known as United Nations Mission in Kosovo, UNMIK. It passed a resolution and that administrative organ was present in Kosovo till the time Kosovian political authority comes into being and they will hand over the charge to this new political authority in the Kosovo wherein, wherein it will continue from that point onwards. So, international territories also come into being but that does not take away the aspect of international legal personality of that particular state. Traditional exposition was stability and effectiveness. However, evolution of self-determination has disturbed the traditional exposition. The idea of self-determination progresses and arises especially after the demand for decolonization comes into being. After 1945, the idea was to allow states to have self-rule, decolonize all the states either in Asia or in Africa. So, the process of decolonization as it started, it came up with the voice of right to self-determination as well. Now, it is not that right to self-determination was against only the colonizers, but also when new political authorities came, new different ethnic groups also raised their voices to claim their right to self-determination. So, this actually disturbed the whole traditional idea of population and boundary and people residing within that boundary because different ethnic groups are now demanding for their own new state and that has happened also either in Africa or in Asia wherever we see ethnic claims new states do come into being. So, right to self-determination adversely affected the traditional idea of territory effectiveness control no change in the territory whatever territory is in existence must continue to be in existence. Well, friends, that is not the case as we recognize the right to self-determination and certainly it has disturbed the idea of traditional expositions. For example, Rhodesia, which is now known as Zimbabwe in today's time, the factual requirements were fulfilled and self-determination as an additional criterion led to a statehood. European community adopted guideline on recognition of new states. So, we not only see recognition coming up as merely a political statement, but this political aspect also gets then recognized. So, in 1991, we see European community adopting guideline on the recognition of new states in Eastern Europe and Soviet Union on 16th December 1991, referred specifically to principle of self-determination. The guideline underlined the need to respect rule of law, democracy and human rights, guarantees for minorities. These guidelines dealt with recognition and not statehood. Sometimes these guidelines be considered in addition to the statehood. Now, what do we understand by recognition and how does it come into being? There are two types of recognition for a given particular territory or a given particular state that is coming into being. There is de jure recognition and there is the de facto recognition. De jure entails the idea of legal recognition. So, at the same time, if you look at de facto recognition, it entails or is based on the idea of factual recognition. So, factually, if all the criteria are fulfilled, that is, it is having a territory, it is having permanent population and capacity to enter into a legal relationship and there is a government taking political control over the given territory. That means, it fulfills all the factual requirements and it must be recognized in that particular scenario. At the same time, if it does not fulfill, if the given territory does not fulfill any of these criteria, factually it does not become a state as far as traditional exposition is concerned. But based merely on the aspects of right to self-determination, a state may be recognized. A state may be recognized by other state. In such situation, the state becomes a legal personality under international law. So, either a state recognition can happen de jure or a state recognition may happen de facto. Constitutive theory that is by not by possessing essential traits of a statehood rather when other state recognize it. There is a criticism to this particular aspect. So, there are different theories with respect to recognition of a state constitutive theory, declaratory theory. Constitutive theory 
is dependent upon a situation where the essential criteria of a statehood are not present. There is a criticism to this particular aspect, as I said. Recognition by no means produces subjects of international law. Recognition is not a conclusive proof. It says that the basic criteria must be fulfilled, without which recognition should not come into being. There is no legal duty on the part of the state to do so. So, according to this theory, the states must not be dependent on other states to be recognized as a state. Once it fulfills the legal criteria, it must come up as a state. However, friends, in the modern times, we have seen change to it. Declaratory theory supports that new exposition and it says statehood exists independent of recognition. Recognition is just a formal acknowledgement through which established facts are accepted. So, declaratory theory argues on the basis of the fact that recognition must not exist as the cut-edge criteria for coming into being of a state, whereas constitutive theory argues opposite to what declaratory theory says, that is not, not by possessing essential traits of a statehood, rather when other states recognize it. So, constitutive theory is more political in nature, declaratory theory is more legal and traditional in nature. How does statehood gets extincted? Even then, in modern times, they may continue to be a state, but then traditional exposition has the pressure from the aspects of legitimacy because merely recognizing it for political purposes somewhere down the line affects the aspects of legitimacy as far as law pertaining to legal personality under international law is concerned. So, therefore, when we talk about extinction of a statehood, there may be merger of two states. Example that I gave you was of West Germany and East Germany, two states merged together. So, a new state comes into being. Dissolution of a state or dissolution of USSR as we see that USSR um, is no more into existence. The certain eastern states, uh, western states uh, or you can say eastern European states in the present times coming into being out of USSR and then Russia coming up as an individual state. Absorption or annexation or geographical disappearance of territory can lead to extinction of a statehood. One of the example, another exam, example can be South and North Yemen merged to form Republic of Yemen, East and West Germany to FRG, dissolution of Czechoslovakia to Czech Republic and Slovakia. Now, when states, when we say that states are the legal personality, either through recognition, through traditional exposition, whatever be the process through which a particular state has become a subject of international law. And when we say this particular state or any particular state is a subject of international law, we mean to understand the effect of being a legal personality under international law. That means, it will have certain rights and as well as certain duties. The duties generally are to maintain territorial integrity of each other, to maintain sovereignty, to respect sovereignty, mutual territorial rights of each other. So, United Nations Charter identifies duties of the state at the same time rights of the state. Apart from that, there are certain fundamental rights of a state that comes into being. One of the basic right of a state is independence or sovereignty. Now, this has been mentioned and can be found in different declarations, charter conventions. Draft declaration on the rights and duties of states prepared in 1949 by International Law Commission as the capacity of a state to provide or its own well-being and development free, development of free from the domination of other states. Political or economic dependence will not affect the above mentioned legal principle. Independence here implies exercise of jurisdiction over territory and population, act of self-defense, etc. Intervention by United Nations does not affect independence, especially where human rights are affected. Duty of a state to not intervene in internal or external aspect of any other state. Declaration on the principles of international law concerning friendly relations and cooperation among the states, 1970. So, we can identify independence or sovereignty of states through these declarations. It also carries equality 
and has the right of peaceful coexistence. Where do we find equality under international law as far as the states are concerned? There is one vote at the United Nations General Assembly. In 1970 declaration, it has been said that all states enjoy sovereign equality, they have equal rights and duties and are equal members of international community. Notwithstanding differences of an economic, political, social or other nature. Each state has duty to respect the personality of other state. Territorial integrity and political independence of a state are inviolable also mentioned under United Nations Charter. Each state has duty to comply fully and in good faith with its international obligations and to live in peace with others. These obligations may entail from either international custom, international conventions or international treaties. However, no equality in creation of law. Now, when we say that there is no equality in creation of law, powerful states as we see today or in the past who have more say as far as international organizations are concerned or politically who have more say due to its economic dominance or military dominance or any other kind of dominance, creation of law would largely be in their hands. The authority is tilted or advantageous in their favor. The other states face certain types of disadvantages at this point of time. And based on this particular argument, we may say that there is somewhere inequality, be it political inequality or other type of economic inequality existing as far as lawmaking is concerned. The one who is more powerful will be in a better position to make laws in its own favor. So, collectively, cumulatively, the states that are the, that, that are at disadvantageous position can come together and argue for their own interests and rights. Peaceful coexistence, 1954, five principles of peaceful coexistence, example of peaceful coexistence are many, but with respect to India, we may say that in 1954, five principles of peaceful coexistence were signed by India and China, which concerned mutual respect for territorial integrity, sovereignty, mutual non-aggression, non-interference, and principle of equality. However, friends, we know that post-1954, in 1960-61-62, we see act of aggression from China into India, wherein Tibet was also attacked and such situation led to violation of these five principles. Bandung Conference 1955, to discuss peace and the role of the Third World War, Third World in Cold War, economic development and decolonization. Well, friends, apart from states, there are different types of states. The states that we understand generally distinct from that, there are protectorate states, protected states, and as well as federal states. Let us understand simply that protectorate states are the states where external matters are in the hands of some other states. Example of it would be Morocco's Treaty Affairs in 1913 with France, handing over all of its international relations, Sub-Saharan Africa being colonial, protectorates. Protected states, on the other hand, are those states where internal as well as external matters are in the hands of some other states. Both are done, invoked through mutual agreement, that is treaty. Here, a separate legal personality exists, however, a separate statehood might be doubtful. Federal states are the states where units of federal states come together. And when these units are in existence, we can say that, or we can ask this question, that whether Units of federal state possess legal personality internationally? The answer to this would be generally no, as we have United States of America or any other state. Apart from the states and different types of states, we have certain territorial entities which are sui generis in nature, mandated territories, trust territories or condominiums. Now, mandated territories came into being after First World War as a result or under League of Nations. Weak or left territories of colonial powers that lost in the war were handed over to advanced nations of that time to ensure that the well-being and development of people in these territories. Trust territories, similar to mandated territories, came after Second World War under United Nations Organization. Legal consequences for states of continued presence in Namibia 1971, ICJ. South Africa was not leaving after the termination of the mandate in Southwest Africa, which is now known as Namibia. And as a result, South Security Council Resolution 301, reaffirming unity and territorial integrity of Namibia came into being. 
And we also have condominiums where joint territory is there. The example of such condominium would be the Republic of Vanuatu, which was earlier known as New Hebrides, which was jointly owned by the English and the French. There are international administration of territories also, United Nations Mission in Kosovo, United Nations Transitional Authority in Cambodia, United Nations Transitional Administration in East Timor. We have the case of Taiwan, we have the case of Vatican City and the Holy See. See, so all of these territories are sui generis in nature, they are sui generis in nature because their identity is somewhere doubtful and in order to remove or avoid a particular kind of doubt, they have been given a special status or they, they have, they carry their own special status as far as international law or legal personality is concerned. Now, friends, apart from the states being the subjects or sui generis territories being the subjects of international law, we also see that international organizations are subjects of international law. And this was finalized in the case of reparation for injuries suffered in the service of the United Nations case 1949. Legal, whether international organizations are legal personalities was the moot question in this particular case. If you look at the facts of the case, we will see that in September 48, Count Folk Bernadotte and other members of United Nations mission to Palestine were allegedly assassinated by the then Israeli government in Jerusalem. Mr. Bernadette was an agent of the United Nations and the United Nations mediator in Palestine. He along with other members of the United Nations were assassinated during the performance of their duties for the organization. Later, the United Nations General Assembly Assembly's question concerning reparation for injuries suffered in the service of the United Nations was referred to the ICJ. Resolution of the General Assembly dated December 3rd, 1948. The issues were whether the United Nations had the capacity to bring an international claim against the state responsible with a view to obtaining reparation for damage caused to the organization and to the victim. The answer was in affirmation by the International Court that United Nations organization or any other organization, international organization for that matter, bears certain rights and duties and without being able to enforce those rights and duties, the existence of international organization would be futile and therefore, international organizations do carry legal personality so that they can claim their rights and duties before an international fora. The second question was that in what manner the action taken by United Nations could be reconciled with such rights as might be possessed by the state of which the victim was a national. So here, since the individual was representing or in a representative capacity or under United Nations organization or it was representing United Nations and not its own state and therefore, international organization that is the United Nations organization in this case would be claiming the rights against the particular state. Another question that we have before is that whether individuals can be categorized as subjects of international law. Well, friends, generally they are not. Indirectly, individuals may be subjects of international law as there are declarations and covenants may about uh, on the subject of human rights and humanitarian laws which directly are protecting the individuals. So, international law does protect individuals under humanitarian law, under environmental law or for that matter under human rights law. So, as per that argument, yes, individuals are subjects of international law. But we also have foras where individuals have been tried in the, for example, Tokyo Tribunal, Nuremberg Trials or for that matter, ICTY or ICTR, ICTR that is International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia or International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. All these, at all these criminal tribunals, individuals were being tried. At the same time, we also can have the example of European Court of Human Rights under Article 34, an individual can reach out to European Court of Human Rights to claim any breach or violation of human rights which has been guaranteed under European law against its own state or against any other state. So, we conclude that it is not only states, but it is international organizations and as well as individuals that can be subjects of international law. Now, with this, I conclude this particular topic. Thank you so much for patient listening. Namaskar. No